And we've been in a series called By Faith. By Faith. And in a nutshell, uh, I just want to let you know what that is. What God can do with people who put their faith in him. That's what that means. It's what God can do. More than what we can do. It's what God can and will do if we will put our faith and trust in his power, his abilities, not so much our own. Amen? <clears throat> now, we're, we're, I'm going to go ahead and just let you know, first of all, we have a lot of scripture to cover today, so I need to get right into this, but I also just want to set up some application to our lives today on the top of this sermon, and just let you know that, you know, the church is living in a really, really uh, interesting time right now. It's spiritual warfare, church. It's a battle. And today's message really lends to that topic. God, with God's help, we are overcomers. <clears throat> we need to be ready. And the devil is, he, don't, he doesn't play games. He doesn't play games. And so we don't need to be playing games either. It's time to get serious. And the devil wants you who are insecure about your abilities or strength to be sidelined. He wants you to do like nothing for God. He wants you to think that God can't use you. <clears throat> he wants you to think about how much you failed and that you're useless to God. But I'm here today to tell you the truth, that with God, all things are possible through you as well. And God's gonna do great things, amen. <clears throat> if you don't feel like you can contribute to God's work, if you feel insecure about your abilities or lack of abilities, if you feel the need to have everything perfect, any of my perfectionists in the room, if you need extra confirmation, like four times, from God to step out, then today should minister to you because we're gonna learn about Gideon and his story. They dubbed him the reluctant warrior because his faith was a little slow to believe. And we're gonna be in the book of Judges, chapter six. So you have the first five books of the Bible. So we're gonna be in the Old Testament. And then you have the sixth book, which is Joshua. And then we have the seventh, which is Judges. Let me give you some background. Joshua died and the people of God did not continue to drive out the Canaanites and surrounding nations in the promised land. They didn't finish the task. Kind of like Pastor Kuhn's message, they were, last week, they were content with partial success. They were going along but didn't keep growing and didn't keep fulfilling the task. You know what I'm saying? Pastor Kuhn, man, he brought the house down last week. I, I was, we watched on the way home from the marriage retreat. I said, man, he's preaching like he's not gonna get fired. He must be retired. Nah, we all preach the truth, right? No matter what. I just thought he did a fantastic job. Fantastic job. Amen. This is a great uh, part two to his message on, on this because sometimes we don't continue in the process after salvation because we're looking so down on ourselves and forgetting that we need to look to God. Well, they didn't finish the task of driving out these nations and what happened was the surrounding nations influenced Israel or the church. And they began to worship other gods. Well, in order to deal with that, because there was no king, God appointed judges as military leaders, not jurists, but military leaders to deal with this issue and to drive out and eliminate any nations in these territories to, to really not to get rid of them, uh, so to say, and push them out, actually. It was actually, they were coming against the people of God, and so now they had to defend themselves because Joshua's uh, people, after he died, didn't finish the task. By the way, that's a lesson for us that we need to disciple the next generation to know what to do next. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've been a believer for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we need you to disciple the next generation because the further away we get from the biblical truth, the further away uh, the ages of, of our believers grow, the younger generation, if they don't know the truth, they're gonna do whatever they wanna do instead of doing what the word of God says to do. 
And so that's a, lot, that's a sermon in itself. All right, let's pray, we're done. <laughs> Gideon was one of those judges. God calls him to deal with oppression of his people. And we're gonna start in chapter six, verse one. And man, we have a lot of reading to do, so let's, let's take a journey. I, I, I wanted to paraphrase scripture, but you just can't do that sometimes because it takes the power from the scripture. Judges six, verse one. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> they must have been starving. These enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels, too no numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. It was like a plague. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. How many know sometimes you gotta be humble in order to cry out to God? When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet, an unknown prophet, we don't know the name, to the Israelites. And he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press. That is not where you put wheat to hide the grain from the Midianites. A wine press is actually pretty small, so that tells you how little wheat he had. Usually it'd be done out in an open space because there's so much. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. What? This is God's I see in you encouragement. I see something in you you don't see in yourself. God sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. Mighty warriors, mighty disciples of Calvary Church, God sees that in you. The devil doesn't want you to see that in you. But God sees that in you. He doesn't see all your inabilities. He sees your ability with him. But the devil's gonna highlight all your inadequacies, all your insecurities, and bring those to the forefront. And God's like, no, put me on the front. Calvary Church. Now I lost my place. Where was I? Okay, 13, okay. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Ooh, ooh, you don't say that to God. Didn't Pastor Kuhn say that last week? You gotta be careful. Isn't it interesting? how we as humans always blame God when the actual problem is we abandon God. God didn't abandon them, they abandoned God. God said what to do, they didn't do what God said to do. And God's not gonna bless those who live in disobedience. You might have some kind of calming strength that you're gonna live off of for a little while, but after a while it's gonna, it's gonna fade, just so you know. You're gonna have some kind of common prosperity and blessing because maybe your job gives so much and does so much or maybe you have so many friends, but after a while, you're gonna find out that you are empty and that God's favor is not upon you. That is the reality. Even, in, even after the cross of Christ, even after the grace of Christ, he is gracious, praise the Lord, but he is not going to bless bad behavior. And if you don't see that now, you will find out later on judgment day. 
So pastors need to preach and we need to preach to each other to clean up our lives and not blame God for abandoning us, but us abandoning God. Look at me, now I'm preaching like I can't get fired or something like that. (laughs) But it's the truth. It's the truth in my life too, right? God won't be with Pastor Ryan if I abandon him. And he humbles me and he'll humble you He'll humble his church that will cry out to him again and reset and repent where we belong. Okay, where was I again now? Thank you. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go, he ignores him. He ignores Gideon's human, I think the Lord that God ignores us sometimes when we say foolish things, right? He ignores him. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go as strength you have. Mm. I'm going to go ahead and give you a pass on that comment. I just want you to go ahead and go with the strength you have. But that preaches, doesn't it? Church, go with the strength you have. And there's a reason why. And rescue Israel for the Midianites. Here's why. I am sending you. God's like, if I'm sending you, I'm with you. But Lord, getting replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. There's those insecurities, right? There's when we have our eyes on ourselves instead of our eyes on God. The Lord said to him, I will be with you. That's why you can go. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Do you know how many Midianites there were? 135,000. It would be like you're fighting one person. That's how powerful I am. Praise the Lord for that. Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. That's just like us, isn't it? All right, God, I'll go forward, but I'm gonna need a little sign from above to help me out here. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He wanted to know if this is really the Lord speaking to him, because if it isn't the Lord, then this is a cool thing about Gideon. If it's not the Lord, he's not so sure. Isn't that that important too? Hey, is this the Lord telling me to do this or is this just good ideas in our society to do, you know? Is this what everyone else is telling me to do or is God telling me to do this? So the angel of the Lord said, I will stay here until you return. Verse 19, Gideon hurried home. He cooked a young goat and with a basket of flour, he baked some bread without yeast. Then carrying the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out and presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. And Gideon did as he was told. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of the staff in his hand and fire flamed up from the rock and consumed all he had brought and the angel of the Lord disappeared. Hebrew says that God is an all-consuming fire. He consumed that entire sacrifice. There was no leftovers for Gideon's family. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. It is all right, the Lord replied. Do not be afraid. You will not die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. There was peace in that moment. He could have taken his life, but instead he spared him. He had mercy on him. And so Gideon's praising God, saying, you are peace. The altar remains in Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abiezer to this day. Praise the Lord for that. Now, that's great. And you would think that he's good to go for war. But God asked him to do something extremely important. He asked him to cleanse his clan from their sin. So we're gonna read 25 through 32. That night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to some say Baal, 
and then others say Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. So Baal was a fertility god of the Canaanites, and the Asherah pole was, the, was representing the, the female, the goddess fertility god that they worshiped, and they were, the people of God were worshiping Baal and at the Asherah pole or Asherah, the goddess of fertility, and this is God's people doing this. And so this is uh, God correcting that and telling them to, to take care of it. And verse 26 says, then build an altar, so tear it down, cut down the Asherah pole, then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole you cut down. So to repent is to get rid of something completely that would cause you to sin again. Get rid of that Asherah pole, get rid of that sin, get it out of your life, burn it, and he's gonna now worship God instead of worshiping these things. So it's not about just stop doing something, now it's to start worshiping God. Direct your worship where it belongs. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord commanded, but he did it at night. Because he's human, he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. Now let me give you an idea of how bad this is. Do you remember in the end of Exodus, if you've been reading through the Bible, Exodus 32, 33, uh, Moses is on the mountain with God getting the commandments. He comes down, he finds Aaron and the people worshiping a golden calf. And God says, I need you to go ahead and find out who's with me and who's with the golden calf. Whoever chooses the golden calf, you're going to eliminate, you're gonna kill. It was brutal. But he had to do that in the beginning because otherwise it would contaminate and pollute the people of God. So it was a brutal consequence to their sin. Now, go future here, it's so bad that now the people of God are being threatened to be killed if they don't worship Baal and Asherah poles. That shows you how much it flipped from a God nation to a godless nation of people. They were godless. And now the people of God were being threatened to be killed. Does it feel like America a little bit? Does it feel like China? Does it feel like Iraq? Does it feel like India? Does it feel like that in our world right now? In Africa and around the world, Christians are being persecuted and killed. But you don't see that on the news, just so you know. But I get it in reports as pastors. So Gideon took, verse 27, took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded, but he did it at a night because he was afraid of the other members of his household. Verse 28, early the next morning, as the people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and that the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. In their place, a new altar had been built, praise the Lord, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. The people said to each other, who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. But Joash shouted to the mob that that confronted him, why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. Okay, dad, protecting your boy. If Baal truly is a god, Let him defend himself. Uh Uh-huh. Because if he is, he, he can, right? If he's real, he'll be able to do it. And destroy the one who broke down his altar. From then on, Gideon was called Jeru Baal, which means let Baal defend himself. By the way, just a little spoiler alert, he never did. He never did kill Gideon. Because God is the only true God. So let's talk, let's just pause here for a moment. I'm on track to get done, so let me pause here for a moment. The reality is, and it's the same for us, we actually have two enemies. And at this time, Gideon's enemy was the Midianites, so physical, and the worship of false idols and gods, spiritual. He needed to deal with both but God wanted him to deal with the spiritual enemy first, the divided loyalty with him. 
They were in this mess in the first place because of their idolatry. So to correct this idolatry is to align yourself with the one true God. So here's the reality. This is a takeaway, really important for all of us. Put it into your own life. Gideon's true weakness wasn't the size of the clan, but the sin of the clan. That was the true weakness. It wasn't that he was the weakest clan or the youngest of his family. It wasn't later on that he only has 300 men. It wasn't gonna be that. It was gonna be that if there is sin in your camp or in your clan or in your life, God wants you to deal with that so that he can work with you and help you. Think about this for a second. Talk about undivided loyalty. You're, if your clan is worshiping other gods, okay, this is deep, so follow with me here, okay? Now, I'm saying this is what happens. I'm not saying the scriptures say that's happening in this moment. I'm saying what I've seen happen. If you worship other things like they were, or if you depend on other things to help you in life, that's not God, but it never shows up to help you, Okay, it never, it never helps, it never works. All right, let's get practical. If, if drinking is your way of coping and feeling better or getting through a situation, guess what happens when you're done? It didn't work. If drugs, if sex, if all these things are your way of coping or busyness is your way of coping and it doesn't work. Okay, now think about Gideon. They worship other gods, and the gods never showed up. What are you gonna do when you start thinking about Yahweh, the one true God? You're gonna think that he's not gonna show up. You're gonna think that you're powerless now, that you, you can't do that task. Wait, is this even God talking to me? There's no way this is God talking to me. Let me do some tests to find out. The reason why is because the more you disconnect from God and rely on everyone else, the, the less you trust God, hear his voice, and obey his call. It's hard to trust Yahweh if everything else you've relied on doesn't work, but the reality is God is not like everyone else. God is above all, and he can do all things. Nothing's too hard for God. See, sin and idolatry in their camp or in our camp weakens and compromises our ability to hear, believe, and obey God. The angel of the Lord appeared to get in and he had to make sure it was God. When we get so disconnected from God, sometimes it takes a while for us to believe it's God. The message for us today is stay so close to God, you know it's God right away. Gideon demonstrated his repentance he demonstrated his allegiance by removing the false god in the altar that was placed there for him, the Asherah pole. He removed the sin, and then he properly built an altar to worship God. And let me tell you something. If we're going to be useful in God's hands, which we are when we're in his hands, our warfare is only as strong as our worship. Think about that. Our warfare is only as strong as our worship. If we worship God, we're all good to go. But if we're worshiping something else, it ain't gonna work, my friends. Our work for God is only as good as our allegiance and reliance on him. God fights along those who aren't rebelling against him. That's an important message. Praise the Lord for that. Well, it's almost time to go into battle and Gideon did what he needed to do. He cleared out some false worship some sin, he repented, and he worshiped the Lord. And then, this is what happens next. So we're gonna be in verse 33. Soon afterward, the armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east formed an alliance against Israel, uh-oh, and crossed the Jordan, camping in the valley of Jezreel. Then, the spirit of the Lord took possession or, over, or came over Gideon in some translations. The spirit of the Lord came over Gideon. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms and the men of the clan of Abiezar came to him. He also sent messengers throughout Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, summoning their warriors and all of them responded. All right, he's got a decent sized army now. But what's better is he has the spirit of the Lord upon him. 
Then Gideon said to God, if you are truly going to use me to rescue Israel as you promised, prove it to me in this way. Oh man, here we go. Hey, we're, we're, we're right there with him, right? We're human. I will put a wool fleece on the threshing floor tonight. If the fleece is wet with dew in the morning, but the ground is dry, then I will know that you are going to help me rescue Israel as you promised. And that is just what happened. When Gideon got up early the next morning, he squeezed the fleece and wrung out a whole bowl full of water. All right, so that's two signs. How about one more? Then Gideon said to God, please don't be angry with me. (laughs) But let me make one more request. Let me use the fleece for one more test. This time, let the fleece remain dry while the ground around it is wet with dew. So that night, God did as Gideon asked. The fleece was dry in the morning, but the ground was covered with dew. Oh, that's just like us, right? Well, let's go on. Just before we do, though, real quick, can we just note how patient God is? Can we just note that real quick? How how gracious and patient God is to now give him three signs to help him out. Isn't that great? Thank the Lord for his grace and patience. He puts up with us, doesn't he? Now, I think God has a sense of humor sometimes when I read these stories. And the next part, I, get, I got to chuckling when I was preparing for my sermon because he reduces his army. <laughs> and it's almost like God does that because, well, you wanted so many tests, now I'm gonna make it even scarier for you. <laughs> Chapter seven, verse one, so Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and his army got up early and went as far as the spring of Herod. The armies of Midian were camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many warriors with you. Oh, what? There's 135,000 out there. I got 32,000. Are you sure, God? If I let, now here's why. If I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they've saved themselves by their own strength. There it is. There it is. When we do it on our own power, we often, when we get the chance, take the credit. When all the credit belongs to God. It all belongs to God. Well, here's what happens next. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave this mountain and go home. So 22,000 of them went home. Now, do you think the rest of the 10,000 were even like probably scared at this point now? Think about that. Put yourself in their shoes. Oh, wait a minute, 22,000. Now I'm scared. Can I go home? Leaving only 10,000 who were willing to fight. But the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. This is where Gideon's like, am I hearing you correctly? Bring them down to the spring and I will test them to determine who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups and one group put all those who cup water in their hands, lap it up with their tongues like dogs and the other group put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Only 300 of them drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. There's theories of why, there's reasons for why. Maybe they weren't as ready because they're looking down instead of kind of keeping their eyes up to drink. Whatever it is, the point is that only 300 men were left. And there's 135,000 Midianites, Amalekites camped outside. That's scary. That's scary. The Lord told Gideon, With these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. So Gideon collected the provisions and ram's horns of the other warriors and sent them home, but he kept the 300 men with him. The Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. And that night the Lord said, get up. Now this is where God is just so generous when we don't deserve it. Go down into the Midianite camp, for I have given you victory over them. But if you are afraid to attack, isn't he understanding? Go down to the camp with your servant, Pura. Listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. 
So Gideon took Purah and went down to the edge of the enemy camp. The armies of Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east had settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts. Their camels were like grains of sand on the seashore. How dramatic is that? Too many to count. Gideon crept up just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. God loves to use dreams, by the way. The man said, I had this dream, and in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over, and knocked it flat. His companion answered, your dream can mean only one thing. God has given Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over Midian and all its allies. Now, can we just pause for a second and go, how does a Gentile oppressor believe that the first time? Maybe not. Maybe just, it was a convincing dream. They knew God. They said, God has given them the victory. Church, just, let me just remind you. I know there's people that deny God exists, but people do believe God exists, and they will believe God exists one day. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. Let's not dare let the world have more faith than we do as a church. We need to have faith. All right, I lost my place again. Where did I go? Okay, here we go. Yep, yep, all right, there we go, okay. Very good. Verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he did exactly what I would do too. Thank you, Lord, that you would do that. I worship you. I worship you, God. So then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, get up, for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. He divided 300 men into three groups. I just, I just can't imagine if I was him. <laughs> That's crazy. 300 men into three groups and gave each man a ram's horn and a clay jar with a torch in it. Now, if I'm one of his soldiers, I'm like, what are we gonna do with this? <laughs> then he said to them, keep your eyes on me. When I come to the edge of the camp, do just as I do. As soon as I and those with me blow the ram's horns, blow your horns too all around the entire camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. It was just after midnight, after the changing of the guard, when Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the Midianite camp. Suddenly they blew the ram's horns and broke their clay jars. Then all three groups blew their horns and broke their jars. They held the blazing torches in their left hands and the horns in their right hands. <clears throat> and, all they sh and they all shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Each man stood at his position around the camp and watched as all the Midianites rushed around in a panic, shouting as they ran to escape. When the 300 Israelites blew their ram's horns, the Lord caused the war, now notice, the Lord caused the warriors in the camp to fight against each other with their swords. Those who were not killed fled to places as far away as Beth near Zerah and to the border of Abel, oh wow, I'm, this, is, this is hard, Mahala. Yeah, there you go, near Tabith. Church, Gideon wins. He wins. First of all, our strength does not depend on numbers when God is on our side. All the stories we've been learning about in faith, about faith, it reminds me what David said. 1 Samuel 17, 47, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. God keeps using people you wouldn't expect so that everyone will know it's the Lord, not us. And I noticed something to connect the New Testament to the Old Testament. The Bible refers to us as jars of clay. And the Bible refers to fire as the Holy Spirit. Notice that those two things won the victory. Church, if we will be humble vessels filled with the fire of the Holy Spirit, we will be victorious in this world. 
We have the power of the Holy Spirit to win every battle, but we must be humble vessels in the hands of God, filled with his powerful spirit. Praise the Lord. How do we apply this story today? Because we're not literally fighting a physical war, although physically we need to overcome some of our insecurities and fears and inabilities or whatever. Well, the world, we live in the world, right? But we're not of the world, we're set apart. The world is influencing the church when we're supposed to be influencing the world. That's the battle. We need to be discipling. We need to be growing as individuals, but also as a church, growing in the word of God, helping other people understand the word of God. I'm talking about discipleship here. And we need to reach the loss, my friends, because we can change minds with the help of God, because God will change their hearts and their minds for us. God brought a young man off the street here a couple weeks ago And because God had already prepared his heart, Pastor John led him to the Lord. They're walking into our building in the middle of the week, church. God is bringing in the harvest right in front of us. He's preparing the harvest. Praise the Lord. Have you seen the way the world is right now? There is not much time. God is gonna begin to bring even more of the harvest in. And we are the laborers in the harvest field. It's not time to sit on the sidelines. It's time to get in the game. We have to make sure that we don't let the enemy deceive us. And so number one, God wants to use you to influence the world, but number one, you gotta have undivided loyalty. Undivided loyalty. They had divided loyalty, and God had to correct them and say, get rid of those false gods. Get rid of those distractions in your life. Put your eyes and faith on me and in me. Here's, the, here's, here's what happens. If we take our eyes off God, we take our eyes off the power. Gideon had a low view of his ability because he had a low view of God's abilities. And it's harder to hear, trust, and obey God when your loyalty is divided or you simply don't know the God of the Bible and what he can do through your life. God is calling us to be set apart from the worldly culture into kingdom culture, and we have Jesus Christ to help us. Secondly, not only do we need undivided loyalty, we need to realize God uses unlikely vessels. God uses unlikely vessels. I wanna go into the New Testament, it'll be on the screen for you. 1 Corinthians 1, 27. God shows things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, like 300 men, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God's, God is in the business of using weak things to shame the wise. Using powerless things in the world's eyes to take down powerful forces in this world like the devil's work. He will use you. You are a soldier for Christ. The weakest of everything is in this story. Just in case we didn't pick up on it, again, Gideon, weakest clan, weakest family member, okay? Secondly, barley bread in the dream. Barley bread is the food for the poor at that time the humble, the lowly, 300 men, we got that, 135,000 versus 300 men, but it would be as if you're only fighting one person. I wonder, by the way, if that one person is us because we're struggling to trust God. What about unlikely weapons? Who brings a clay pot and a trumpet to a war? (laughs) And then yells, and then you win. Well, God's people do. God loves using those who are weak because in his hands we are strong. When we see the kingdom work that needs to be done and then look in the mirror, we tend to immediately disqualify ourselves 
Instead of looking in the mirror, you need to look in the word. God took dust and made us. God can take us and make us warrior disciples for him. If we hold a view from a human perspective rather than a divine perspective, in other words, what God can do, we will limit ourselves and you will limit your neighbor in this room. There's no way he or she could do that. Yes, they can, with God's help. Thirdly, we have uncommon power. What do I mean by that? The power we need is divine and unique. You can't find it in a store. You can't buy it. You can't work out until you get it. You can't earn it. This uncommon power, this divine power comes by faith. And anyone can have faith in Christ. And anyone can have faith in God. It's uncommon power that's unstoppable power. It's the Holy Spirit in your life. God requires faith, not power or expertise. And the temptation is to do everything we can to prepare and to be, have everything perfect, but in the process, we neglect a reliance of the Holy Spirit's power. I'll be honest with you, there's times where I, I feel like I'm over-preparing and I haven't left room for God on Sunday morning. Church, we gotta leave room for God. Actually, we gotta let God lead completely. Praise the Lord. We have to leave room for God because God isn't going to use someone who wants to do everything perfectly on their own power because the glory won't go to him. We tend to take it. And here's the other thing too. When we step out in faith, the spirit of God comes upon us. You already have the spirit of God in you if you're saved. If you would step out and do God's work, you're gonna see his spirit come into you and work in you and give you the power and the ability. Students at schools don't know what to say, don't know what to pray, don't know how to encourage. Well, first of all, should we, should we prepare? Absolutely. We should prepare. We should read the word. We should study the word. We should pray. We should fast. We should prepare ourselves to go out into our workplaces, into our schools, all those things but don't try to do it all on your own power or knowledge. You need the power of the Holy Spirit to break through spiritual things. Students, college students, young adults, parents, workers, coworkers in the labor field, retirees, whatever you may be, God is not done with you yet. Whoever you are, God has work for you to do. Do not depend on your power. And do not wait till you have everything perfect to say something to someone who needs Jesus or to do what he's asked you to do. If you over-prepare with yourself, you're leaving the Holy Spirit out of the equation. Let him work. And lastly, undeniable credit goes to God. There's no denying it. All the credit and glory goes to God. God is the hero in this story. He gets the glory in our story. Praise the Lord. Church, it's not about you. It's not about me. Thank you for letting me get a break for five weeks. It's not about me, okay? Do not come to this church to follow Pastor Ryan. That's a failure. Do not do that. I'm not saying I'm a failure. I'm just saying that's a, that's a, that's a bad idea. That's a wrong choice, a bad choice, Okay? Praise the Lord, I'm an overcomer through Christ. Do not worship a pastor. Do not worship a human. It's not about us. It's about Elohim, about Yahweh. It's about Jesus Christ. It's about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the one that saves. He's the one that saves. Praise the Lord. A.W. Tozer, a pastor, a theologian, I really enjoy reading. He said this. God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity we plan to do things we can only do by ourselves. Let's stop planning to do things on our own power. Let's stop dreaming so small. Let's stop believing so small. God can take 300. God can take this church and change this state and this world for his glory and all the churches working together for his glory. Undeniable credit goes to God. Lastly, he said this in the scripture, I'm saying it to you today. Go with the strength you have and the Lord will be with you. 
Go with the strength you have, and the Lord will be with you. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. Look, I don't know how you need to apply this. I had a brother, I mean, there's many ways you can apply this. I, I know how you can apply this. You can start sharing your faith. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I give you examples of how you can do this, but I said this in the first service, I'm gonna say it to you. How do you need to apply this in your life this week? The notes are online, calvarydover.org forward slash grow. You can read my notes, you can read questions you might wanna go through as a family, as a small group, whatever. It's always there after the sermon notes, okay? How does God want you to apply this? You ready for this? I get a text message after the first service. A husband is carrying the, the weight and the burden of his wife's surgery that was really hard and he's serving her as best as he can. And he said, Ryan, I've been trying to do it on my own power. I need to do it on God's power. And so I prayed, I sent, sent back a message saying, may the Lord heal your wife in Jesus' name. And may the Lord give you his mighty strength and endurance to get through this season. I didn't think of applying it that way. Let the Holy Spirit help you apply this to whatever situation you're in. He'll help you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this encouraging word today, this powerful word from your scripture. And Lord, we're very much like Gideon. God, I pray that you would quicken our faith to believe. And Lord, we're grateful for the confirmation. We got plenty of confirmation in your word though. You will be with us as we go. Lord, give us the strength. Lord, we don't want you to have to pull our arm. God, give us the faith to go. Give us the faith to do what you call us to do. God, you've been whispering things in our hearts and minds, things that we're reluctant to obey or believe it's you. Lord, confirm those things this week. We could use some confirmation. And Lord, we prepare. Yes, we, we read our word, we pray, we seek counsel. But Lord, ultimately, we wanna be obedient to you. Not because of anyone else, but because of you speaking to us and guiding us. Lord, use this church in the latter days of this last days that we live in, these last days. God, we are in the latter days of the last days. Lord, we need to be ready. God, make us strong in you. We are strong in the Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for your mighty strength. We leave here with faith that even in the midst of our weakness, you are strong. You make us strong. And we believe that. 